Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Use the chat and tell us where you are if you are so inclined. It's one of the fun parts about doing these on Zoom. People come from all over the place. Capitol Hill in Seattle. Portland, Oregon, San Francisco, welcome. Seattle, Costa Book Larder. Excellent. Fremont, Wallingford area representing. From Indonesia, welcome. Vancouver, BC. Wallingford, me too. Wallingford in Seattle, not Connecticut. I think there's a Wallingford, Connecticut, maybe. Ontario, Nashville. Excellent. So we'll let a few more of you get logged in here before we get started. Oh, this is so fun. Sierra Madre. Hello, Southeast Portland, Toronto, welcome. All right. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. And more people will join us soon. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Laura Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington that's called Book Larder. We have just started to do a very few in-person things in the shop again, including um, a cooking class a week and a very rare author talk, mostly with folks locally and here on the West Coast. But we are still bringing you all kinds of events from Zoom, including the one tonight. I'm absolutely honored to be celebrating the release of Dory Greenspan's 14th book, Baking with Dory, with Dory tonight. She is going to be in conversation with Erin McDowell, author most recently of last year's wildly popular book on pie. The two of them are going to chat about baking with Dory. They are going to talk about baking in general, and they will also leave time for your questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please use that little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen on Zoom for those questions. That'll just make it a lot easier for Aaron to keep track, especially with so many people tuning in tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, you can support this author talk by purchasing your book from booklarder.com. I will put a link in our little chat here in just a bit so that to make that easier for you. As you can see, we've got signed copies. Dory was kind enough to send us book plates, and so your copy will be signed. This talk and all of our other talks will be on our YouTube channel as, uh, within a couple of days. So if you have to jump off early or if you just want to watch it again, you can do that on the Book Larder YouTube channel. All right. So now please join me in welcoming Dory Greenspan and Erin McDowell. Hello, Dory. Hi, Erin. Hi. I you Hi, two to it. We did it. We pressed the right buttons. <laughs> we did it. We've there entered at the perfect moment. <laughs> it's so good to be here. Thank you, Laura. She disappeared. <laughs> I think she's leaving us to, to talk now, but the I can't believe how lucky I am to be talking to you on the night of the release of this book. I was just saying that before we started. And how does it feel like book 14? How does it feel? It feels kind of the way it did book one, still really exciting, still kind of jumpy and a little nervous. And, you know, you think you'd get used to this, but no. <laughs> no. You put so much of yourself into it. And I, I, we were saying before, I think every book is different. So then the, re, the way you feel and the reaction that you get, it is different every time in that way a little bit too, I would imagine. But also, yes, but also the past, how many books have, there's, there's been an intermix. <laughs> there's been, you know, there's, I mean, even, even my last book, which was Everyday Dory 2018, when I was at Book Larder, I was at Book Larder. I could never have imagined that we would be at home talking to one another, that someone from Indonesia would be joining us. Um, it's sad. The reason that we're doing this is sad, but it's also exciting to be able to have so many people join us. This is wasn't like this 30 years ago when my first book came out. 
You know, I think that that's such an interesting point also, because um, just as an example, I've written several books, but never even had the opportunity to really tour and go places in person because I was, you know, a new author. And, and so they don't always ready to take the chance on some of that. And what's interesting about this is that it really allowed me um, with, with COVID to promote the book very differently than, than ever before. And I also think that with you, your books are so like you're in the kitchen with us. And so I think that what is so cool about being able to reach out to people in this capacity is also the bake-alongs, the opportunities to do some of these demos that are more informal. I mean, you're literally seeing my living room right now, you know, nothing, no, no fancy set, no, you know, some of the things that we would have maybe before COVID in the time of promotion. So I think that that is such an interesting observation of, of that. Um, I, yeah, sorry, no, go ahead, sorry. I've just been fascinated by being able to gather people this way and to think that, you know, so uh, trust me, no one sent me on tour for my first book. Um, in fact, I mean, I bought a copy for my mother and I assume she was the only person in America who had a copy. <laughs> Um, but now, I mean, I have been lucky enough to go on tour, but you go to big cities mm -hmm. and it's wonderful. And I look forward to doing that, but there are people who bake all across the world. And this is an opportunity for us to be together in a way that just wasn't possible before. Absolutely. And I, the, and you're in my kitchen. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to say is the ability. It, it also united everyone in a way of, you know, kind of common goals of enjoying baking. And that was one of the things that was, I mean, I, I think a lot of people have said that plenty, but it, one of the most pleasant byproducts of all of this for me was the number of people who tried baking something that had maybe been on their like, I'll try when I have time list. And it's like, there was finally time and lots of people got baking like lots of different uh, things that they maybe weren't before. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically about this book because we, well, there's a few different things. One, for those of you who haven't seen this book yet, the photographs are unbelievable. And we were just talking about before um, we got started that this was, you were remote for this shoot, correct? You were not with them when they were doing it. No, and just to back up, so this is Aaron's, uh, I, I, it's backwards, right? Uh, <laughs> no, it's not backwards, it's not backwards. Yeah? No. Oh. So um, this is Aaron's last book, and it's beautiful and wonderful, and the photography is by Mark Weinberg, and when I saw your book, I thought, it's so beautiful. I would love to have Mark shoot my book. And he did. And, so, he did. and he did. And it was your book that inspired me to want to work with Mark. That is so, that is really amazing and so cool. And one of the things that's so cool about Mark as a photographer is that he loves to bake. So that, I mean, he photographs all kinds of things, but I think there's like a special care and appreciation with baked goods because he really, he loves to bake. Like he actually, he bakes incredible pies and bread. He's really an amazing baker. So. And you see, I mean, a, a person who photographs food should love food. And while we were, you found the one page that didn't have a picture. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm going, I'm going. <laughs> but when, so the book has 150 recipes and the, it, most of the recipes are photographed. And this was done, as Erin mentioned, on Zoom. So I know, isn't that gorgeous? Oh, beautiful. Yeah, I mean, so I was sitting in a little cottage because this beautiful yellow kitchen was being torn apart. And I'm in a cottage sitting on a, a bridge table on a little like fold up chair for 11 hours a day watching the screen. And at first I was frustrated that I couldn't be, I mean, it was last September. So um, it was a skeleton crew working on it. Everyone with masks, not the usual, oh, taste this, oh, taste this, or pinch off a, a piece. Um, but it was so exciting to watch. In some ways, seeing it on screen was almost more informative than, than being on top of it. 
um, because I really was seeing what it would look like on the page. Absolutely. And it was so wonderful to work with the team, with M Mark Weinberg, with um, Sam, Samantha, Cinevaratin, with Brooke Dionarine, um, and Dream team, dream I, team, everybody. This is a true dream team. Well, and you see it in the pictures and to just watch as like, just when you think the picture was done, you say, I love this. They, Mark would say, don't clear the set yet, just go work. And then he would continue to play. And sometimes as he was playing, he found what was the perfect shot. And I was just as I was saying that, I was thinking it's a little bit how it is in the kitchen. You strike, you're, you're working on a recipe, you, you, you're working on it, you think, okay, this is what I want. And then you look at it or you taste it and you think, orange zest. If I add orange zest, that's going to make it better. And you make those little changes as you, as you go along. Uh, this is like, I'm getting tingly here listening to you because um, I, this is one of my favorite things when, when you can talk to someone who like speaks your language and it's just like, I felt that feeling earlier today, Dory. And so I was like, it needs this. I knew exactly what, and it's also um, the picture. What I think is so interesting about what you're saying there is that for years before I wrote a book, I was a food stylist. And one of the things that was, I loved doing cookbooks and I, I struggled sometimes because I loved having the author there because you really need them to make sure that everything is right. But I styled one book over the pandemic as well that was remote like that. And it was a very, it was, you know, I still missed a lot of the things of, a, of the in-person sure. photo shoot, but it was a really interesting experience. And I do think sometimes it allowed the creative team to go where their head was going. And sometimes like you're saying, surprise, you know, and I think that that is something that a Mark does really well. He sometimes zooms in real close or does, changes one thing and it just changes everything. You know, it's, um, Erin and I were talking about the process of, of writing a cookbook and that until you get to the point where an editor jumps in and a photography team starts working on it, you're alone. And you know, you have people tasting your food and you're, you're, you're sharing what you're making, but those aha moments, those, it needs a little of this, or oh, I found the right way, that all happens in the kitchen with no one around. Absolutely, and like sometimes, it's then you're waiting for two years for someone else to have to share the aha moment of like making it and, and experiencing yeah. it. Um, and that actually brings me to a question about the world peace 2.0 that I've been wanting to ask you. Um, when I saw this as like a headliner on your Instagram the other day, the big news about the world peace 2.0, and my husband and I were shocked because one year, years ago for Food 52, they were doing a big pop-up and our task was to keep cookies coming out at all times. And one, uh, there were only two cookies that we were making and one was the World Peace Cookies. So that year we made about, I don't know, a hundred dozen World Peace Cookies. And so I know that recipe, like the back of my hand, I love it. I've made it on vacation when I don't have the recipe in front of me. And I am dying to try the new World Peace cookie. So tell us all about how that came to be. So first I'll tell you about, for anyone who doesn't know, I'll show, so my book is already, I've used it so much um, that yeah, I broke the cover on it. Um, <laughs> I just, I broke the binding and I have another copy, but I kind of feel like this was my first, right? It's a special one. <laughs> um, so this is the new World Peace cookie. And if you look from a distance, it looks like the old World Peace cookie. So <laughs> the World Peace cookie started life more than 20 years ago in Paris in a restaurant called Corova. And it was Pierre Hermé, the French pastry chef, who created the world, who created this chocolate cookie for Corova. And when I was working on the book Paris Sweets, he gave me the recipe. And whenever somebody would ask if when I'd sign, remember book signings? When I would sign a copy of Paris Suites, somebody might say, where should I start? And I'd say, start on page six with the Corova cookie. And it was just a great cookie. It's 
a cross between a French shortbread, a sable, and our American chocolate chip cookie. And Pierre said that he added brown sugar to the dough so that it would kind of tilt a little bit American chocolate chip. And it's got chunks of chocolate in it and it has salt. And these days, I mean, we just expect salt in something sweet and we sprinkle salt right on top of things. But in the way back, the idea that you would bite into something sweet and taste the salt and have the flavor of the salt linger was revolutionary. Cookie appears in Paris sweets. I love it. Other people love it. I'm now working. I'm baking from my home to yours. It's 2006 is when it came out. And I have just about finished the manuscript when my neighbor stops me in the elevator and says, you know that cookie, the one with the name I never can pronounce. And I said, the Corova cookie. He said, oh, we don't call it that. We call it the world peace cookie. Because if there, if everyone in the world, right, had this cookie, peace. All would be peace. well. <laughs> right. And so I thought with a name like that, I've got to include it. And so it became the World Peace Cookie. And it truly has traveled around. There are millions of, you know, Google World Peace Cookie in there. And many times, you know, people have written to me or I've seen on social media that somebody put peanut butter in it or, or caramel chips or mint chips. Or, and I would tinker a little bit, but nothing. It's a great cookie. And then I, I guess about two years ago, I'm not sure when, Charlotte Druckmann, the author, asked if I would right, revise this cookie for her book, Women on Food. And I said, no. I said, there's no reason to revise something that's perfect. And then after, after I had talked to her, I thought, women, world peace, maybe I could take some ingredients that corresponded in my brain, (laughs) probably in no one else's brain, but, but you know, like corresponded in my brain to the qualities that I admired in women. And so I worked and I worked and I worked and I just, I added rye flour for earthiness, cocoa nibs for strength, cayenne or piment d'espelette, something chili-ish for just that unpredictability and, and, you know, playfulness and freeze-dried raspberries for kind of sass and verve and I love that verve. That was, I loved reading that in the head note. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's also, you know how those those freeze-dried raspberries have a little bit of an edge to them. They're a little acidic. Um, and when I made the cookie, I liked it. And of course, that was the most important thing. It was fun to think about, right, and clever. But if it didn't taste great, I was just going to say, I, you know, I can't do it. But it's a great cookie. I, I think what's so, first of all, I think it's so cool how inspiration can hit in that way of like, uh, I actually talk about that all the time that I miss the creative writing prompts that I used to get in like high school because they were crazy, but I would end up writing something, you know, that I didn't know would come of it. And I think sometimes when someone gives you a recipe prompt or something like that, it does sort of start those wheels churning. And that cookie is such a complex cookie while also being such a simple one. And what's so cool is that you added all of those other things that still maintain, like you said, it still looks like the world peace cookie. I can't wait. I'm not saying that it's the first thing that everyone should make because there are so many amazing things in the book, but you have to go read the head note too, because it made me feel feelings and it made me, I already feel attached to this cookie. So it was kind of like cool to see how, you know, something can continue to evolve also. It was, you know, it's when you said you were attached to it, it was, I, I knew obviously that a lot of people love that cookie. And so it's kind of risky to say, changed it, but, um, but you can still make the original. That one lives on forever. And that's also, it's nice. Uh, I think sometimes I think that's how people learn more about like your process and um, your, um, you know, even the creation of a great recipe is if you're already familiar with a recipe and then someone comes in with a couple of changes, it actually can kind of teach you the inner workings of that recipe a little bit and like what's going on behind it. You know, I love, and I 
done this ever since my first book, the one my mother had. Um, I've always <laughs> had a little section when it was appropriate, when I could make it fit, called playing around. In my French books, it's called, you know, my the books about French pastry and, and French baking and food, it's called Bunny Day, Good Idea. But they're just little suggestions for how you can tweak a recipe, how you can change it. I love the idea that all of you, wherever you are, can take a recipe and play with it because maybe you don't have an ingredient and have to substitute. Maybe you don't like one of the ingredients. Maybe you have a new idea about it. And so it's a little bit that prompt that you talked about, that prompt to creativity, and, but it's also, I hope, um, encouragement to, to make something your own in the kitchen to play. Absolutely. I think that that's something that one of the reasons that I want to help teach people to bake is because I think if people understand how it works, they'll feel more empowered to make those changes themselves. And that's one of the things that is so wonderful, especially when you can present it like these playing around sections, you present it in a way where it's just like, oh, and by the way, it also can do this and this and this and this. And that's what the way though, that, you know, not everybody who's baking at home is thinking and you're, you're thinking that way for us. <laughs> it was, it also kind of helped me out because, um, I, if, if, if I don't get the email that says your deadline is looming, I, I mean, I'd still be working on my first book, right? Because I just work and I have these what if moments, you know, what if, what if this were savory, not sweet? What if this were a layer cake instead of a cookie? What if, what if would, and so Playing around gives me a place to put a few of those what ifs and kind of pass them along to all the other bakers. Like, I'm thinking, what if? What if you try it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I also think that actually brings me to something else I wanted to ask you, which is uh, finding ways, like you said, to present other information like that. I think it's sometimes also important to almost think of the pages like real estate, like, like <laughs> you don't want to leave a big empty space somewhere that could maybe have some kind of idea or something valuable in it. And I found myself in the editing stages of the book being like, that's a whole quarter of a page that's empty. I know what we can put there. Like, here's one more thing. <laughs> you know, and, and because I, you know, I, I know and love your books, um, and because you just said that, <laughs> like it's one of, I, I feel like if I say this, I can say we, that we cookbook authors are always thinking about the reader, the home baker. It's, it makes no sense to write any cookbook if all you're thinking about is yourself. You, it's, I feel like writing a cookbook, writing a recipe, is, is an act of generosity, of wanting to share and of wanting the person who's getting the recipe to be successful. That we're, we're cheerleaders. I'm we're sorry, one of my devices, even though Do Not Disturb is on, is buzzing, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Interrupting the most beautiful thing you were saying, everyone. Well, no, I, I feel like we're coaches, we're teachers, when we write a recipe, we're, we're hoping to teach someone how to make something that we like, that we hope they'll like. And we're, we're, we're cheerleaders. Come on, you can do it. You, you know, do this. You're going to enjoy the process. You're going to make something you love. You're going to share it with other people. All we want when we write recipes is for people to be successful. That's a great way of putting it. And it's also, um, does it, does answering those questions help you determine what is going to make it in in the end and even like how it's organized and stuff because every now and then there's like an idea that I feel like I enjoy it but I know it isn't for everybody else or or it isn't like you're saying when you're thinking about the reader first rather than just kind of the collection that you're creating um how does that help you determine what what's going to go inside well you know but that's interesting because I think 
you have to you have to believe that what you you have to believe in your recipes you're putting together a book collection you have to believe that the collection will hold together and you have to believe that your taste will make not everyone happy but it will find you know it, it will find an audience and so you need to be true to yourself in that sense and if i have a recipe that i really like that i think might be a bit just like a little further away from my usual, I'll keep it and find a way to encourage someone to make it. So when I made the miso maple loaf, which is um, on the back of the, it's such a beautiful photograph, on the back of the book, there we are together. Um, <laughs> I, thought, <coughs> excuse me, I thought this is a really odd, combination. One doesn't expect miso in a cake. Um, and it's, I love this cake because it teeters between sweet and savory because it can, it has jam on top, but it could have a piece of cheddar, you know, on a, on a slice. And I thought a lot about it. And I thought, is this going to be something that will just be too weird? And then I thought, I love it. I want people to try this. And even, you know, today is the book's birthday, but this recipe has kind of been out. It was part of a, 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 a pre-order, a sneak peek. And everyone loves it. And so I feel, you know, I, I'm so happy because I did kind of question, is this right? Well, and, but I felt strongly about it. Mm, and I mean, I think you're right. You have to trust your gut and you have to, I mean, the tasters don't lie either because sometimes I'll kind of be waffling on something and enough people will taste it and, and they all just love it so much that I at least know I'm on the right track or I'm, you know, headed. And then that's actually something else. Talking about the cover, you were talking about the back cover. This cake that's on the front cover, like sleeper hit, it's a gluten-free cake and look at it. It looks amazing. I was reading about it and you were like casually at the end of the head note about how amazing this cake is. You were like, oh, and by the way, it's gluten-free. And I was just like, what? <laughs> I know, maybe I should, yeah, maybe I should have said that on top. So this is the <laughs> Lisbon chocolate cake. And um, my husband and I were in Lisbon. We were headed to the airport. We had a little bit of time to be able to stop and have coffee and cake. And we went to a cafe that had coffee and tea and this cake that was, or I don't, I, this is my version of that cake, um, but they only had one cake. They had this cake, they were famous for it. And I had it, I loved it. I took a picture of it and off to the airport. And when we got home, I started working on it immediately. And I didn't know what it, what it was. So I was just kind of trying to remember, looking at the picture. Okay, is that a mousse? Mm, maybe it's a ganache. No, I think it tasted like ganache. What? And made the cake and only afterward realized, oh yeah, it's gluten-free. But it's an interesting cake because it looks gorgeous. You could serve this at Beautiful. any celebration, but it's super simple to make. So it's almost like a flourless brownie on the bottom. Then it is a whipped ganache. So you have to just like put it in the refrigerator and hang out because every few minutes you need to give it a stir. And then to me, what's, well, it's the whole thing is interesting to me, but I love the, the cocoa on top because it's not a sprinkle. It's not a dusting. It's not a decoration for just it's a true element in the dessert. So cocoa is bitter and that once again, edge, I keep thinking that, you know, I love a dessert with edge. So <laughs> there's that bitterness that plays against the sweet cake and the ganache. It's, I was so happy when that cake turned up on the cover. It's, it literally is such a cover girl, even going through the book and like, looking, I mean, there are so many beautiful things in the book, but when I got to the this page for the recipe, I was just like, it still took me back. I was like, yes, it's so, and it, I love what you're saying about it being such a sharp looking, like it, because to me, 
especially chocolate desserts. I think they're some of the ones everybody wants, but they're also, they have some air of intimidation around them sometimes. And, and this, like I said, I was reading through it and I was like, I could make this tonight. You know, like I could, I could get started. Yeah, you could get started. And so I love this, this cake is a perfect example of it, but I love a cake that I love so much about baking, but I love a cake that looks this gorgeous, but a first timer can make it. Mm -hmm. I love any kind of dessert, um, any kind of baking where you think you know what it is, but then you taste it and it's like, oh, I didn't know that would be there, right? Yes. So um, I, well, like the miso in the loaf, like the, I have star cookies that- um, uh, the, That photo is beautiful. I'm finding that while you talk. <laughs> okay, so it's this beautiful cookie. It's just a simple rollout spice cookie and it looks so pretty because it's got sanding sugar on it. There it is. And I love that it, it I mean, it could be any color, but it's gorgeous in, in white. Um, but there's star anise in there. And star anise is the kind of spice that you might have a little drop of in something where it would be part of a spice blend, but here it really stars. And so you don't expect it, you take a bite and you just stop and think of it. And I, you know, it's that kind of thing. I love the everything cake, which is a simple cake that you just stir together. You can do it in a few minutes but it's got a million variations, right? So it's, the recipe is this long and the variations are a whole page. <laughs> um, and, and so you can build your own surprise into it. Those are the kinds of recipes, you know, I love. And I love when they're beautiful because the ingredients are beautiful or they're beautiful because the shape is beautiful or because the top cracks. Yeah. So while I love layer cakes and there's a whole, sweetheart section of them I like okay the book just opened to this so there's right there's nothing here it's just a cake and I find it gorgeous completely I think actually I think there's been a big resurgence of appreciation of some of the the like I don't even want to say simple or humble baked goods because they're not always sometimes some of these cakes that don't have layers and icing are still you know, pretty labor intensive or, you know, they might have things going on. Um, but I, I think that some of those recipes in particular, like you said, that stand alone, your book, this one in particular has a real way of making you look through it and think that it looks doable, but it still does look really um, appealing to the eye. And I think it's because you've thought of some of those things and you're embracing, like if something cracks, it's like, well, let's highlight those cracks. Let's like bring them out and Right, because I think they're beautiful. I think they show that you put your thumbs into the cookie. So I just, here's the, I don't know if, I'm, I'm holding up these pictures. I can't tell if you really can see. No, we can see. So well, there's a little the, bit of a glare on that one, but we can see it. This yeah, is there. like the everything cake. And this one has orange on it. A friend of mine just made it with apples and some booze. Mm -hmm. um, it could... These are, I, I get as excited about cakes like this as I do about the devil's food cake, layer cake, which I love. Um, but, it's, and I think this is what, this is what people can make. It's the everything cake you could make every day that, and when, when you love to bake, you want to bake often. So it's nice to have these kinds of, of recipes, just to, you know, back pocket recipes. Well, but I also, you know, I start when I started this book, it says that this is three years in the making. Um, I was traveling. So we have the Lisbon cake and I have the fika, which is the coffee break tradition in, in Sweden. I have the cake that a Swedish pastry chef taught me. I have um, a recipe from Paris. And then I had what I was making in this kitchen from the supermarket because I was confined as everyone yeah. was during that time. And I think it helped make this book um, a simple, it, it made this, it grounded this book. Mm. 
made it a book that, um, you know, I bought all of my ingredients in Stop and Shop and you can too. Mm-hmm. And it really helped me think about everyday baking. And when we worked on the, you know, trying to think of the subtitle, the reading title for the book, it's sweet, salty, and simple. And um, for design purposes, I couldn't get them to make the word simple, you know, like sky high. But I was so glad to be able to put that on the title and feel that it really represented. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, I love that you said that because you're so right. It's like, even after a whole week of baking, what do I want to do on Saturday morning? I want to bake. And so I think that there's something um, to be said for having kind of a repertoire of recipes that are um, kind of all, you could make them at any given time. You could spend any amount of time on them. You could judge them up when you want to. You could dress it down a little bit, you know, serve a crowd. There's like all these different options. And again, that's encouraging people to think creatively um, about the way that they're baking and the way that they're doing it themselves. I have to talk about one pie because I can't leave it alone. (laughs) You are a pie. <laughs> I wouldn't be me if I didn't talk about the pie. And it's um, it's actually not a pie. It's the Pandowdy, but I loved this oh. Pandowdy recipe. And I think that so many people, if you're not sure what you're going to make for the holidays this year, maybe consider this Pandowdy. Oh, look at that. It's it's really beautiful and it's if you've never made a pie before well if you've never made a pie before then you need Erin's book (laughs) but if you've never made a pie before this one's for you because it's meant to be rustic ragged higgledy piggledy there's nothing about this that's precise so it's just apples and sugar and a little lemon juice you could add spice but I just love apple itself And so it's what you might fill an apple pie with or a crisp. You want it to be juicy. And then instead of a a bottom, there's no bottom crust. And instead of a perfect top crust, I just take the dough and I usually take like a pizza wheel or ravioli, uh, ravioli, yeah, cutter that's, you know, rickrack and just cut pieces of the dough and put them on top of the apples any which way. I put some sanding sugar on top of it, it bakes. And no matter what you do to it, it's gorgeous. And it's meant to be really simple and homey. So you scoop it out, you can turn it over so that the crust is on the bottom and the apples are on top. You can put some whipped cream or some ice cream on top of it. You can serve it warm or at room temperature. It's like, it's for this moment as fall Absolutely. I mean, it's, I I think also so many people don't know about all of the different variations of those fruit desserts. And like, for people who think that pie is too complicated and, you know, it's like, don't worry about the soggy bottom because on the top there, it's going to get so crisp and that the sanding sugar ties it together in a way, like it literally looks like a beautiful elaborate lattice, but it's so, so simple to recreate that. Right. It's just, and you, and it can be any kind of pastry. You could even kind of turn it into a cobbler and put scraps of biscuit dough, you know, Mm -hmm. on top. Once it's more, it's more a template than it is a recipe. You read how to do it. You look at what you've got at home, check the recipe, make it. I love that. It'll be different every time. It'll be delicious every time. Um, Well, I wanted to, maybe there's a couple of questions uh, here that maybe I will start throwing your way because and one person actually left the nicest note over here in the uh, chat as well. I always have the world cook peace cookies in my freezer because they are my favorite ever. And I can't wait to try the new version. So that's exciting. Well, may I just say one world peace thing again? Yes. So, or actually with any kind of, so the world peace cookie, which I, I didn't say that, um, but whoever has the dough in her freezer knows that it's a slice and bake cookie after you make it, You just make a log of the dough and you either refrigerate it or freeze it. I was talking to the boy who bakes, Ed Kimber. and Ed told me that he always has dough in his freezer for World Peace Cookies. And he does something that I thought is just so lovely. And it's as with the holidays 
you know, coming up. It's something to keep in mind. He, when he goes to visit someone, brings baked cookies and then brings a log of dough as well. So oh. isn't that perfect? I, I just love that. Just when, when you said a log of dough in the freezer, I thought, so I think of that as kind of like now and then, a now and then present. Here are the cookies and tuck this away in your freezer and you'll have it for whenever you want it. I love that. That is such a great, I am definitely going to start doing that. I, uh, that is an amazing plan <laughs> that leave it to Ed. That's so amazing. Um, okay. One question here. How is this book different than your baking book of 2006? It's so that's a great, that's a great question. It comes, this book, if, if, so it has 13 siblings that came before it and its closest sib would be Baking From My Home to Yours. Baking From My Home to Yours came out 15 years ago. It's hard for me to believe, but yes, it's, it's 15 years old. Um, this is, I think of this as my first all purpose baking book since Baking From My Home to Yours. I think if you look at these recipes, you'll see that there are ingredients in them that I never would have thought of using 15 years ago and probably couldn't have gotten. I mean, the fact that I can go to the supermarket here in small town Connecticut and find miso, find the- Freeze-dried raspberries. Freeze dry, that's right, that's right. Good quality chocolate. I mean, things have really changed. And so this book takes advantage of that change. It's got, as I said, my tastes have gotten simpler. The recipes have gotten simpler. I don't think they're any less interesting. I just think that they, they're they simpler. So you're right to, to think of the two together, but this is, this is 15 years later, things have changed. Yeah, I, I think the in, point about ingredients is, is so true because even in the length of my career, the amount of things that are available, it's so, so different. And that really, that's inspiration just waiting, you know, to come in a way when you can have something, like I saw the ruby chocolate and the devil's thumbprints, so beautiful and so simple. And we didn't have ruby chocolate then. And so it's so beautiful because it, in a sense, it's its own decoration. Mm -hmm. also, 15 years later, I get to play in ways that, I mean, so I adore pate um, cream puff dough, and I've made gougere forever. So there are gougere and around my French table, there are gougere in everyday dory. There's a new gougere in this book. And for the first time, so I've been making them for years. For the first time, I thought, you know, gougere don't have to be round. I can make sticks. And by having longer gougere, it changes the texture and the way you experience it. And then while I was piping out sticks, I thought, so the cream puff dough is so great because it's neutral. It's neither sweet nor savory. You make it what you want. I made essentially, you know, cream puff poppy sticks. Love I, that. Right? I had never thought of using the dough like this and of making the dough really crunchy because it's thin and baked and dried a little bit. So you might, do I have cream puffs in? I think I have profiterol um, in baking from my home to yours, but you don't have the poppy sticks. This is me 15 years later playing with things that you know are classic, but are not in this in this Absolutely. World. Yeah. Every, every experience, every new ingredient, all of these things keep changing. I mean, that's, what's so great about this world of food is that we're always learning. There's always going to be something new that's coming out. That's, a, you know, we can work with and play with. And, and you even have the playing around like right in the book. And that's like, in some ways what you're just pushing those boundaries and playing around in every which way. Um, okay. Let's see. Let's get another question here. Um, uh, oh, when you photograph a book remotely, who does the baking for the photos and the, there, I, yeah. let's shout her out a million times. <laughs> She's so amazing. Um, 
Sam Sinovaratne, whom you might know from her own cookbooks and from her adorable series on Food 52, um, Cook and a Half, that she does with four-year-old son, Artie. You must the see best. Right. The best. Sam was the, the, the baker. Um, Laura Manzano was her assistant. And they baked and styled all of the food. And when you've done your past books, do you do I, some of the baking or, or have you always had a food stylist? Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't do all of the baking. Um, there's often a food stylist. And I remember years ago talking to an editor and saying, well, should I bake my own food? And um, she said, no. She said, you really want someone to see it. You know, I see my food one particular way she said you want other eyes on it you want other hands yeah. and the fact is I am so slow we would still if, if I were in charge of a hundred and some odd to do it we'd still be photographing <laughs> I, I mean that is not that's the hardest part about doing a cookbook for sure is the amount of stuff you have to do in a fairly short period of time I'd be there saying wait wait just like let me this doesn't look so even let me just <laughs> I'm so glad that the talented Sam did it. And there's also um, when you are, I've always encouraged my friends who are, you know, still amazing at styling food and making beautiful things. When they do a cookbook, I say the one thing that's so great about having a food stylist is they don't just understand how to make the food look good. They also understand the way the camera works because say <laughs> one side is a little crooked or something, you can sometimes just rotate it and there's perspective and there's all of these things that are, really come with being around it the same way baking does. I'm in awe of what Sam and the team were able to do. I can get dinner on the table. I can get a birthday cake off to a party. I never could have done that. I, I mean, the images yeah, are all- right, because It's a different way of looking at it, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, all of these images are so beautiful and they also still like, What's, what's amazing about having another perspective is so much great work comes under collaboration. So you can kind of see the recipe reflected through somebody else. And sometimes it even contributes somehow to making it better or making it oh. maybe not better, but translating it, you know, perfectly. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Let's see um, here. Can I, I just wanna oh. say, so I met, we mentioned all of the great people who, who helped and worked you know, teammates on the book. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm writing a newsletter. Um, maybe we can put the, the address up in the chat. So it's storygreenspan.bulletin.com. Um, the newsletter is called XOXO Dory. And I'm doing it twice a week. And I'm, in, I'm writing about um, the people who work with me. And so what it was like you know, it's, it's the behind the scenes of putting this book together, what it was like to test the recipes. And so I've written about Mary Dodd, who's my recipe tester. I just talked to Mar Weinberg, the photographer, and we'll be talking about particular shots and what it was like when, and he'll, he'll be giving um, tips on like pro tips, how to use your iPhone to get the kinds of, or other phone, you know, your smart, to, to, to get the kinds of, of pictures that you want. And so I'll be um, kind of introducing you to this team and giving you behind the scenes views, so. That's amazing. Yeah, everybody, they put it in the chat. So everybody go to sign up for that newsletter because uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very excited to, to read all of those genius tips from Mark and Sam and everybody. Um, what recipe from Baking with Dory surprised you when you developed slash finalized it? Well, okay, so there were a bunch. Should I tell you about the one that really surprised me and is not in the book? I made a Dutch baby. I made a, so there's a savory section in the book called Salty Side Up. And I have been making Dutch babies forever, you know, puff pancakes. And I had one that had scallions. I can't, I, I blocked this out because of this experience. <laughs> and I made it, it was gorgeous. I still have the photograph on my desk, desk 
desktop. So <laughs> puffed up way above the, the cast iron skillet, came down, all those other, put it in the bowl. No one could make it work after I had done it. It was like a kitchen witch had flown in and said, you're never going to be able to make this Dutch baby again. <laughs> and so my editor, Rux Martin, who was your editor as well, <laughs> Rux made it. She said, I love Dutch babies. She made it. She said, you know, this one's not any good. And I said, that can't be. And I made it and I couldn't get it to work again. Oh my gosh. What happened? I wonder I what happened. I don't know. I don't know. So there's no Dutch baby in the book. There hasn't been a savory Dutch baby in my house now for over a year. <laughs> that surprised me. Uh, that That is a great story from the making of the cookbook, actually. And I actually love to hear about some of those recipes that don't make it in because so often people don't get to hear about those. Someone wrote in the comments, RIP, savory Dutch baby. <laughs> <laughs> um Someone said, how many scarves does Dory have? <laughs> I want to know the answer to that question, too. It's, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> don't know. I have many. So I've been collecting, wearing, enjoying scarves for years and years. Um, I, My husband, the wonderful Michael, um, usually buys me a scarf every time a book is published. And I haven't gotten my Baking with Dory scarf yet. The kids, Joshua and Lindley gave me a gorgeous scarf on Sunday and said, um, here, this is your Baking with Dory scarf. But I'm still waiting for Michael. <laughs> well, I'll post it if, it post it if it comes around. I want to see a picture uh, of Baking with Dory scarf. Uh, you know, I could wear the same thing every day. And in fact, in, in today's newsletter, I talked about the fact that like I have a uniform. You'll see me again in this smock. Um, <laughs> But it's the scarves. I'm just, I'm crazy about them. I, I'm. Pr you probably have as many scarves as I have bandanas at this point. So we'll just call it a collection. <laughs> we'll get them together someday. They can hang out. <laughs> um, let's see what, um, oh, this was a good question. If you were stranded on a desert island and could only bring one dessert in this book with you, what would it be? You thought that was a good question? <laughs> I want to know when people ask, you know, it's funny that you say that because it's really a hard question. I hate when people ask me to pick one favorite. I really do because I love all my children equally. <laughs> okay. So here I am flipping through because I can't come up. Oh, I love those. I'm looking at the flapjacks. Um, one, I can only have one. You know what I might? Yep. Okay. I'm bringing my classic chocolate chip cookie. You know what? That's a pro answer. That's a pro answer right there. Right. I mean, I know, I know how satisfying it is. I'll never get bored. I could have that cookie and do have that cookie <laughs> a few times a day. I have a stack right over there. Um, yeah, I think I um, go. I think I go classic. I think, I mean, I think also, you know, you're never going to be disappointed by that. Sometimes, you know, you might, it, it's, it, it hits all the, all the, all the points. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, hmm. What are some simple techniques, changes, or other things that you can recommend to elevate your baking? Simple techniques or changes. So I think the, the best thing that you can do actually the easiest thing um, to kind of lift your baking is to take a look at your ingredients and see if maybe you can go up one level on them. Mm. You know, is there for, for chocolate, I always think I, I love to take a bar of chocolate and chop it for chocolate chip cookies rather than use chips take chocolate that I really love to eat and use it in. So look at your chocolate, look at your vanilla, mm. think about the salt that you're using. Um, I test all of my recipes with supermarket butter. And I do that because I want to make sure they work at this level, just, you know, the baseline level, but play around a little, 
you know, one day buy one of those European butters that has a little bit more butter fat in it. Look at Kerry Gold or look at a French butter. Um, just, I think ingredients can make the biggest difference in baking. I think that's a great tip. And also for everyone who's getting this book, there are so many tips about ingredients and it's just like one simple thing, like the Ruby chocolate, which is an example I already listed, but that can really take a cookie that's already really beautiful and special and just make it really different. And I think that's one of the things that you do so well is bring these almost like pastry chef tips, but that are very, um, you know, just, it is in this case, it's a very simple addition, a simple change. Easy. So I just, for anyone who doesn't know, this is, well, this is the chapter opener. So you think this beautiful pink is the natural color of the ruby chocolate. So just melting the chocolate and putting them in thumbprints makes a, a, a good looking cookie gorgeous and ready for the holidays. I also loved the juxtaposition of the two devil's thumbprints together. Like I liked seeing the two. I was thinking how pretty that would be in a cookie box too with the two different kinds. So I really love that. Actually, you it, uh, now that you say that and I'm looking at it, I'm thinking if you don't have time to do bunches of cookies for your cookie box, just alternating mm, yes. would it's make really a beautiful good. box when you open it. And you could add some white chocolate as a, as a filler. So one cookie, different fillers, box done. I love that. That's a great, that's also, that's the, that's the holiday cookie tip of the year. <laughs> the best question for last because this is something that I think everyone wants to know what is Dory most excited to bake with her new adorable granddaughter Gemma <laughs> uh, oh so uh, I just I can't wait until she can bake so when she's here we have a, a high chair that hooks onto the kitchen counter and she looks interested I mean she really watches as I'm doing things and, you know, I'm saying to her, I'm just whisking the flour now, smell the cinnamon. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. But um, she wasn't, I, as I said, I have the classic chocolate chip cookies here. And I left um, a bunch of them at her house on when I was there on Sunday. And they're very careful. Joshua and Lennon are very careful about giving her sweets but they gave her a little corner of the cookie. Yeah, it, she has been like looking at the, I, and so she's had corners every morning now. Oh like, my gosh. <laughs> a, little, a little bit like the devil, but um, it is kind of cute to see her with a tiny little cookie. Yes. Yeah. Well, we got it. You got to break her in a little bit. What was one of your favorite things that you made with your son before? I'm sorry, I threw, they said last question and I threw oh, in one good. more. <laughs> okay. I'm going to stay for the answer for this one. <laughs> well, we did lots of things together. We made biscuits together because it was so much fun to get dirty and yeah. kind of make a mess and like squeeze together. Um, we, of course, we made, we made cookies together. We always made cookies together. And I made him a chocolate cake for his birthday every year. And as he got older, he would frost with me. And I mean, there's nothing better than being in the kitchen. Uh, completely completely I it's every time I bake with kids it's like I fall in love with baking all over again that's why I was like this is the perfect question to end on <laughs> no perfect and and the book is dedicated to Gemma as well which I just you know just like made yes. my heart warm when I saw it <laughs> yes Thank you so much, Dory. And thank you, Erin, for leading such a lovely conversation. I think, Dory, just based on the chat, we're going to have to have to have you back next for like a little tour of your scarf collection and maybe a tying glass. I don't know. <laughs> I think people would tune in I for that. <laughs> I would be delighted. Um, it would also give me the chance to straighten out those, I was going to say the box of scarves, but it's actually boxes. Oh, yeah. It, there's yeah, a, so, hey, no shame, Dory. Own, <laughs> own, own your scarf, no shame in the scarf okay. game. That's right. That's right. This is so lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. No, thank it was you, so Aaron, much fun. Taking the time. And thank you, everyone who came. I couldn't, I was looking at Erin, so I couldn't follow this chat, but. No, we'll print it out. We'll send you a copy of it, Dory, so you can see it afterwards. Oh, that would be so nice. Oh, wait yeah. a second. I can join this club. Yeah, exactly. Here we go. Thank you, everyone. And congratulations, Dory, on the book.
Thank Aaron, you. Thank you again. Oh, perfect. I love this. You got a gram? <laughs> do, it again. do it again. I'll smile. I was going like this. <laughs> perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Congratulations. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. Bye. Thanks. Bye.